Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are premiering, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon, so a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to first and foremost new Patreon, Julian Jeremiah, so thank you very much for joining me on Patreon, Julian, really appreciate the support, Maxi Tykan, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuka, Bose Nail, Samson, Maris, Mobile Max 777 Harry Blade, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, Rob H, The Real Gabster, Windrider, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Nyby, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Fireball X, TheFlatEarthChannel.com, Texas Mike, Edwin Johnson and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will raise the mic on whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their conversation while I set up for today's live show. The appeal to authority fallacy and we discuss it sometimes um, but this definition seems to contradict the definition you give at times. And we can discuss it. Sure. If you like. Okay, I'll just just one. I mean, you can discuss it because I'm going to make coffee and press lots of buttons. But if, I, if, <laughs> okay. I, if I'm sat here, I will respond. I'll just to I'll you. make a short case, right? It'll take thirty seconds, and then uh, then we maybe we can discuss okay. it, or we can just leave it. I don't know. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I should just find it again. One sec. Got so some... in short, uh, this uh, definition, um, okay, so appeal to authority is directly from Google, uh, from the homepage logicalfallacious.com, insisting that a claim is true simply because a valid authority or expert on the issue said it was true without any other supporting evidence offered. Also see the appeal to false authority. Yeah, what's wrong with that? That's fine. Um, okay, so I uh, watched the preview of the premiere you will have uh, tonight. Um, and in that, there's a guy, a young guy, uh, who is uh, saying uh, something along the lines of mm, appeal to authority fallacy uh, is when a scientist says it's true because he's a scientist uh, and therefore he knows. And you correct him on, um, you correct him on that. Yeah, you could argue the toss that I was wrong in correcting him on it. But my, what's the words, train of thought was for him, was along the lines of he saying, I'm a scientist, just generic. Not I'm a subject matter expert in astrophysics. I'm a scientist. Therefore, if you ask me about medicine, I know. Like, well, what kind of scientist is it? Do you see what I mean? So that's the kind of lines I was going along. Although just in isolation when he said that, when I was listening to it back, I thought to myself, well, technically, no. In isolation, what he said isn't correct. I'm working under the assumption that he means generic scientist when I'm specifically saying subject matter expert on a given claim with citation. That's not an appeal to authority. Whereas with that in mind, you can contextualise his statement as false. But in isolation, it isn't. So you're right. And I did pick up on that while I was editing it. So, yeah, good catch. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, I didn't catch the uh, entire context, right? I just uh, watched the preview. You have two minutes preview or something. Exactly. Like so it's a 13-minute video. And, obviously, I've got to hack out a fair amount of context to get that down to three minutes for a trailer. So, yes, there is a certain amount of qualification and context that's given in the main video. However... I still listened back to the edit, three-minute edit, that is, the one you're talking about, and went, yep, that's fine. So I don't mind 
the criticism because it means we get to discuss it again. So I'm happy with that. And if you were to watch the three minute video that comes out tomorrow at 7 a.m. UK time, you'd hear all the context. Yeah, I'll watch that for, for sure. So that was all for me. Anyway, have a nice show, guys. Always oh, good to hear you, Rune. Nice to have you on, as always. Hello. There was going to be another birthday today. No, no, it's my daughter's birthday on Sunday. Well, the appeal uh, to authority, um, that's, if you're appealing to a legitimate authority, is not a logical fallacy. But if you're, like, whatever they say, if it's not backed with evidence, is a baseless assertion. Well, any site, exactly, that's block. correct. Any citation on its face without supporting evidence is a baseless assertion fallacy. And there's nothing wrong with using citation to back your point if it's got evidence or your citation is the evidence. You know, it's in the citation, the actual evidence itself. Now, often when we cite people like Musa, we're citing them as a hostile witness. This is what you say is gravity. <laughs> you know what I mean? And on its face, this citation, if used by them, would be a baseless assertion fallacy. You're correct, John. Yeah, it's a it's a fine line, like the difference between cherry picking and a, a citation. You know, there's a, a fine line to walk. Hey, John. Even with cherry picking, you'll find pitfalls. <laughs> Is that line straight or curved? <laughs> Good morning. Morning. You also, with cherry picking, find yourself in quite a few jams. <laughs> Very good. Go get your coffee, man. Yeah, go get your coffee. I, I've got a Coke just Any, for anybody speed. Have a, <laughs> anybody have a birthday <laughs> today? Not me. Mine's next month. Okay, another day off. <laughs> I'm an August 1st kid myself. Oh, you're August too. Yeah, me. Me too. And I'm 1980. Oh, you're the same year as me as well. Oh, so we're almost identical ages within two weeks. Yeah, we'll have to wait till January. The 80s was the best time ever. I got love for you if you were born in the 80s. The 80s. I mean, just the music. I'm 83, I was 18 years old. Walking around with $5,000 in my pocket daily. Did I just hear you say you were walking around with five grand? I was working on a cake truck, like I would make the cake orders for those uh, lunch car, like lunch trucks that pull to construction sites. So my aunt got me a job there, and all of those guys are schemers. So I was selling fireworks for one guy, other things for another guy. I was making a lot of money. That's good. 18 years old. Construction workers are schemers. They're always running the tip board or something. Every time I go out in the on the job site when I'm working, they're trying to sell something. No, these guys these guys had lunch with, uh, cars, so they drove around different sites. Not not just construction sites. It could be factories, and they they had it was a lunch wagon, lunch cars. There was like sixty of them, and my aunt used to make the food for them. And then I remember one day she came out like a maniac after one of the guys because she seen him giving me something. Don't you give my nephew nothing to sell. Oh, forget it. Uh, funny. Just do a little announcement. If you're a member and you're watching this on the members only stream, if you can leave me a comment, I've made a whole shed load of changes, not through choice through necessity and because my kid sat on my preamp and reset it yesterday which I, I was in tears i can tell you now it took a lot of time to get it working correctly <laughs> and then she sat on it and reset all the types 
but I had to go through it and do it all manually. And uh, in the process, I was reading up how to do various different things on voice meter and learn a, a load of new tricks um, in terms of hopefully how to get the audio better. So if the audio is considerably worse, <laughs> obviously let me know uh, in the comments. However, I would hope, or at least going on what I'm monitoring at the moment, it sounds better. So John's a closer level to Neil and Tenth Man, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Excellent. Thank goodness, I was having to put my phone so far away from me, I couldn't hit the mic button. John, you can have the phone in the next room, and your voice is still going to carry. Whatever you're doing, it's perfect, John, because you're exactly the same level. That said, I put a limiter on that one line, your line. So if you do happen to get a bit overexcited, hopefully it won't clip. Well, it'll clip, but it won't. I don't know what it'll do. It'll just clip your mic, and hopefully I'll limit how nasty that sounds at this end. We'll see. I try not to get on the mic if I'm excited, because I usually say something stupid when I'm not when I'm worked up. I've never heard you get excited. You need the R value to say something stupid. I, I was about to say that there's nothing to get excited about for John anymore because most arguments end in him coming in right at the last moment after everything's been said and done and saying you need R for that. <laughs> That's the end of the conversation. <laughs> so we both thought the same thing, didn't we? Well, they're really like after after the radius was debunked. There was no argument left. Well, not for you, because you were honestly looking at the effects of the argument without a radius. But yeah, that's what I mean. I, I ain't saying there's not a debate to be had amongst the Western world. I'm just saying it's not for me. So why are they saying that R is not needed for gravity, concept of gravity? Let me go back understand. and forth with people in chat, and they're swearing to me. No, you're wrong. They're wrong on an Nathan Oakley show. Okay, for, gravitation I, I, needs. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Keep asking. Them to give you the mathematical description. Well, just stop, stop, stop. Right. So Neil's asking, why do they need R for gravity? Well, let's just break it down. We've got five minutes. We'll start with Newtonian, John, if you don't mind. Why would you need R for Newtonian gravity? Because M two is the uh, the center of M two is earth in that equation the radius to have a center of something that's what i said okay perfect so you need r for it what about einsteinian gravity assertions m1 in that equation mass one you know so i guess you could have a empty freaking universe with einsteinian but that's all you can do. Happy Neil? That was quicker than I expected. Oh, I'm happy. I'm happy. I was. I'm on, trying to understand why they don't think you need it. Well, because we've debunked it. So they need as anti flat earthers to tell us that we no longer need something we've debunked. Because obviously, if we've debunked it, they can't use it. So they just say we don't need it. It's like Earth curve. Well, obviously, we don't need to assert that we've got Earth curve at the horizon. Who would ever assert such a thing anyway? Well, you would when you say Earth curve blocks things. <laughs> Nobody claims the horizon's Earth curve, says the anti-flat earther Tim Osman in response. You know, if you've debunked it, they no longer want to use it, even if they need it. Oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't explain that well enough. Um, on Einsteinian, the M1 assertion, you'd need the volume for your M1 value and you need a radius if you think it's a sphere to get your volume did you follow that neil yeah yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're fighting a losing battle and i think i got to the bottom of it this martha fox lady she has somebody one of her family members i think works at nasa so um i guess that's where it all comes from She's a fanboy.
but um it's it's weird because um I want to call them liars but at the same time I don't want to call them liars because sometimes a person uh argument from ignorance fallacy I think it is right they'll just they'll just you know because you when you're having the conversation logically like when you say something in their mind like they understand the logic and they're like well that can't be not understanding that you're talking about aspects of the model that you can't just replace or disregard like when that guy said well you know at best you debunked the uh the radius like <laughs> How could you not know how damning that is? But, because, you know. because they've only got a surface level understanding of their own rhetoric. That's why. That's correct. We have an advanced understanding of all things heliocentric on this panel right now. I mean, I, there might be a few people in Discord that I can't speak on behalf of, but I'm going to say for the most part, we've all got a very good understanding of what heliocentrism is and what it entails in many different aspects. Many of the people who we oppose don't. They'll do a surface level, scratch the surface, and then they'll parrot off whatever they've read without actually giving it any deep consideration or research. They're headline readers. Hey, hello, guys. Hey, Arwin. Hmm. Yeah, we have an advanced a... knowledge. So is there a difference between an argument from ignorance fallacy and argument from invincible ignorance fallacy or is it just the same thing what's invincible ignorance what is it yeah i've never heard of that anybody else ever heard of that invincible ignorance well that's what um uh, i go to google and that's what it says it, it more or less states that whenever you show someone something and uh i'll just post it in the chat because i might misrepresent it whenever no, no, just i say read it. it just read, just read what it says the fact the fact that it's a real term <laughs> amazing well, well it's say. another uh in, in like an intentional ignorance you know uh, i think that's what it's referring to okay i guess that would be stupidity yeah, I, I put, really, I like I, that a lot. It, it encompasses everything that, you know, <laughs> I try to say when I'm talking about some of these people. Yeah, it, invincible ignorance, what you just laid out there, John. Like, the fact that they're, like, doing it on purpose. You're like, you can't be this dumb. Like, it, they probably, but because they're probably doing it on purpose. It states that the invincible ignorance fallacy is a deductive fallacy of circulatory where the person in question simply refuses to believe the argument, ignoring any evidence given. Oh, I like that one. Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below this video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. 
Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. One last time, if you're new to the channel or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth debate. Now we are joined by 10th Man, Father of a Stolen Child, Arwin, Neil and a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Morning all. How are you? And good night to people on the other side of the globe. Got a message saying, <laughs> saying David Weiss said he wants to join the panel. Uh, send him a link, Arwin, if you can. As your former moderator of DITRH, I'm pretty sure you can manage to send him on a link if you know he wants to join. Up early, is he not? Arwin's ignoring me completely. Come on. Well, it... That's what he said in my chat, and it was actually him because he did have a wrench, so... It is very early, I agree. No, I don't, I don't, know. I don't have it there. on Skype, though. I don't see him in the chat. But... Hold on. I hope he comes on, because I want to race. Can't be any more early than California. Let's crack on with housekeeping. Also, there's something that Adam's requested I do at some stage in regards to the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator. It's description of how it came to pass and maybe an explanation of why we have hyena thrown in there occasionally as well. But um, I'll do that after we do a bit of housekeeping. If everyone else is keen to crack on, I'll check if everyone's off mute in Discord as I haven't actually done that yet. But any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon, formerly known AJM. Yes. <laughs> AJM, can you hear us? Because we can certainly hear you. Uh, Okie dokie. <laughs> sounds like he's in the middle of a storm. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Rear edge horizon, anybody at all? No, well, that's what we're asking for. If you have a ball, you're going to need a physical geometric horizon that blocks things. Not mirages, not optical issues. A perspective. Well, when it appears to block things, it could be a mirage. You never know now. Oh my goodness. If you just imagine that your circle of view is actually a sphere edge, then you might think of it as a sphere. Yeah, indeed. So the furthest you see that automatically says that's a sphere edge, just because it's the furthest you see that day. Hold on, we're thinking of it doesn't make it a sphere edge. Yeah, it's synonymous well, though, isn't it? So when someone says horizon, the automatic assumption on a, a globe side of this argument is that it's the edge of a sphere Earth. That's what their horizon is. Meanwhile, we only have one horizon, and the horizon in their begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking Earth curve calculator is physical and geometric. The one we see in reality is not physical and is not geometric and is not Earth curve. Our horizon is not Earth curve. What was Tim Osmond's famous quote about the horizon? Nobody claimed the horizon is Earth curve, end quote, Tim Osmond, after having the black swan argument put to him. If the Earth is a sphere radius 3959, then every measurement to the horizon can be no more than 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. That would be the geometric horizon and its limitations. And the black swan images show beyond the limitation of a sphere, radius 3959, is our horizon. Therefore, the horizon is not Earth curve. Didn't he come with pictures too that same day? Yes, the pictures he had were of the horizon and labelled, this is Earth curve. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? The evidence of an actus. Hold on, Earth is flat. Did you want to add something? Yeah, hot mic. But Earth is flat. Can you pop yourself on mute? Or or join a live show. Leave yourself off mute and bugger off from your mic. That would be my best advice too. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for your participation. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? 
Hello and good morning. Hey, Chocolate. There's endless arguments why we don't see deviation, though. Well, that's the new thing, right? <laughs> you argue. <laughs> you make the the negative argument for the positive claim that that's like global logic in 2021. Like yeah. Levels curve, shit like that. Levels curve. We wouldn't expect to see drift. You know, basically anti-flat Earth arguments are what we're highlighting okay. these days. Not non-visible horizons. You know, <laughs> all, all that good stuff. How is something going to have a radial path without a radius? That just does not make sense. Any evidence of the R value? That would be Earth radius. We can derive it from a presupposition of positions of celestial bodies in relation to the Earth's surface. No, you can't. You know what you something can... derived from a presupposition is? Not non-existent. That's not true. The presupposition does exist. Look, all Arwen's trying to do is offer him a route in to beg the question of R again by way of deriving a non-physical non -physical location called the equator. Right, Arwen? Yeah, it's derived, I know. Anybody want to flog that old dead rotten horse <laughs> with flies coming off it? <laughs> in this course but, but the, the thing about it though <laughs> even though it's not proof it's not proof of course it isn't really but yeah there is this weird orientation of the celestial bodies in relation to the earth's surface and that's still kind of left open like why is it orientated the way it is you know so it leaves this open gap why are the celestials orientated like that that's where you've got to watch what Arwen says, especially words like it, right? It is orientated. What's it? The non-Euclidean based celestial lights. Well, sod all to do with what's on the ground then. No, no, no. They are orientated in a very specific relation to the ground that is persistent. Go on then. Well, my tree. Oh, done. Go on. Beg the question then, Arwin. Or should I say, <laughs> Bullwin? What? No. I'm not going to ask the question. Make... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead over that. Don, go ahead. So, to make a point, I, I got trees surrounding my house outside. They're oriented perfectly, matching up to my house. But it doesn't tell me the shape of my house. Doesn't it, but it? Hold on. It go, is... go ahead, Arwin. Don't they? I bet if you all leave it growing, eventually that, yeah, your house may wither and get destroyed, and then the trees will all be surrounding it, kind of sort of revealing the shape of what the house used to be inside of there a little. Didn't think I was going to say well, that, did game. you? I don't know how that's related to anything. That was very... Uh where you went with it, Arwen? Look, I no know one's... you you gave this example of why you can't use the orientation of something other than the object itself to determine anything about it, and I kind of disproved that on the spot. No, you didn't. <laughs> nobody just nobody highlighted that it was a non sequitur fallacy. I just did. I said I said what if? Sounds like a what if game. Is anybody other than sure. Baldwin going to peddle this nonsense? I'm not Baldwin right now. I never presupposed anything. He did. You presupposed... Just... Oh, yeah, you haven't actually made the claim yeah, yet, have you? All of this is benign, then. You haven't actually made any claim in this regard. So this is kind of, let's move on, because we're not getting anywhere with this. I mean, that is ideal ball tactics, though, isn't it? Don't actually make the claim. Just talk a load of nonsense that's a prerequisite to the bullshit that you're going to claim later. Yeah, but if it was really for the ball, then I would have quickly dropped in a presupposition somewhere, though. Yeah, admittedly, you know better. Let's move on. We've had, what, axial rotation and earth curve, or have we just had earth curve so far? R value. We had earth curve, we had R. We had R, because I whispered black swan already, so that's done. <laughs> yeah, I did that because we were talking about R. So let's do any evidence of axial rotation of the earth-based variety. 
Uh, John already asked, Kyle, do you need access first? So, do we have one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lockstep motion of the air causes hurricanes. <laughs> Lockstep motion of air. Hmm. How does that work out? I don't know, but they say that the Coriolis deviation causes hurricanes. But if the air moves in lockstep with the rotating Earth, then how does that lockstep moving air cause the hurricanes? You, you start yourself. that off with they say, <laughs> it, it kind of sounds like a ghost story and shit. Like, they say. <laughs> it's pretty much what it is. Yeah. That's so, that's... I'm sorry, is that Nathan? I'm feeding back. What's going on? Why is it all going quiet? I think Eli's trying to talk, but I think he's feeding back. All right. Try again, Eli. Yeah, I think I might have forgot what I was trying to say, though. <laughs> That's all right. There's plenty more housekeeping um, questions. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Well, first you'd have to know what it is. So as soon as somebody can give me a solid definition, then we could attempt to formulate a hypothesis about that definition. Not about the definition, about the observed phenomena. You don't formulate a hypothesis based on a definition. Well, you gotta start to define it first before you can get to a phenomenon. Right? No. First, you have to no. observe it, not define it. Define unicorns for me, Arwin. Uh, well, generally, we know it as a horse with a horn on its forehead. It's excellent right? definition. So now we're going to validate by way of hypothesis the unicorn phenomena that is magical unicorn time travel. Well, no, but now that it has been defined, it can better be established that it isn't actually a binding by a phenomena in order to apply the scientific method. Oh, well, that's super useful. Yeah. Meanwhile, in order to have a hypothesis, there's only really two things in a hypothesis if you ignore all the things that are going to kept, be kept constant. One is the phenomena. That would be a dependent variable. You're definitely going to need that. And the other is your assumed cause of that phenomena. Your independent variable, presumed cause of the effect you're studying. And the effect you're studying is the phenomena. And the phenomena is the occurrence. And the occurrence is not a definition of something. It's an obs an observation of it. You watch something happen and go, I wonder what cause is that? Well, why don't you just assume the phenomena? Well, that's what they do. do. That? that is what they do. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> but what well, phenomenon? Exactly. All objects go down. Just uh, make one up. All objects. Yeah, no, no. You just make you conjure one out of maths. So you say all objects have got a force of down, and when they're stationary, not doing anything, they've actually got a one g down on them. Nine point eight meters per second per second, applicable always to everything. And when you're actually in free fall, then you the other end of the scale, you're actually at a zero. You're in zero g when you're actually hurtling towards the ground. So you just move the the positioning one either side and suddenly you've got a force when nobody's doing anything and then you go about qualifying what that force is and if somebody challenges that you go well without the force i'm presupposing when you're not doing anything in equilibrium you'd float off into the sky and you go would i yeah because i've presupposed the force that's holding you here let's calculate it um i have a question so about the, that. the yeah. same way you can assume forces you could just assume optical phenomena like the geometric horizon right you just say oh Look on this piece of paper. There's geometric horizon. Define this visible, and then somebody will come around and tell us, "No, nah, that only exists in the math." Well, but, they don't. They don't have an accurate description of their phenomenon either, because it's built on a false assumption. Well, well when you're making about, it up, I mean, acceleration rate, right? Isn't that supposedly some sort of a phenomenon claim? The acceleration rate things falling or going up 
things well, don't to add, actually happen. To add to, things don't fall at the same rate, though, do they? Yeah, to the, add to the point nine eight point square meters. But the, with the Cavendish non-experiment, they're measuring a horizontal path where the lead balls are attracted to each other. What's the variable of no, the mean, Earth, Earth uh, acting upon it? It's not. It's mass attracting mass. So the fact that it operates in the horizontal plane is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. The phenomena they're assuming to be studying is the problem. The hypothesis being, if mass, then mass attracts mass. Number one, what's mass? Number two, where do we observe mass attracting mass in nature? Where's the phenomena occurring? Well, mass doesn't attract mass. It's violated by the behaviour of gas, which has mass in their vocabulary. So, mass isn't attracting mass. If I was in the chat now, I'd put a little arrow pointing my, towards my own name and then and a helium balloon emoji next to it and watch it go up the chat, you know, rising up. And if I was a that? Glober, I would just say, well, the definitions of words are meaningless. Therefore, we don't care what mass is. It just, it just attracts itself. So that's nice. How are, you going, to calculate, how are you going to calculate mass if you don't know the volume? And you need the radius to get the volume. How are you going to calculate mass when you don't know what it is? <laughs> oh, hold on. As per usual, John has drawn a swift conclusion to this conversation. Can you just repeat that, please, John? How are you going to find the mass of an object if you don't know its volume? You can't calculate anything without its volume, so you're going to need the radius for that. Yes. Precise. Well, I'd like to also add to the chemistryworld.com, moreover, studies have shown that the amount of substance is often incorrectly identified with mass. So what is mass? Yeah, that's a description of mole. Mm-hmm. Somebody say inertia quick. Inertia. Well, it's a mathematical ambiguity for anything that exists, right? It's called an equivocation fallacy. Having two definitions for something is an equivocation. So you can't have two definitions for one word when you're using it in the context of one description. To just use that as a means of changing what it is at any given circumstance. What I'm saying, though, is the only things that really uh, objectively exist or, or physically exist, I'm sorry, physically exist, are uh, objects and objects in motion. Like, so there's your ambiguity. Any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? No. No. What's crazy is, like, you can actually say no to that, and, like, there's no, there's no rebuttal. Like, a Glover might come on and say, Oh, you guys are dumb. You don't understand. Yeah, but, well, can you answer the question? And they'll find a way to obfuscate or, you know, attack you personally. It's crazy that the answer is straight up no. Yeah, shockingly, there's no science for the globe. Nobody in that field uses the scientific method. It's guesswork, it's leaps of logic. You missed out the stutter where Michu Kaku says nobody under uses the scientific method. Well, that's yes, where that's that is. I was using that as a defense of heliocentrism, though. <laughs> a defense is that they don't validate anything empirically. Oh, wow, what great defense. Yeah, they um, they guess at it till they get it right, right? That's how that's how they uh, do uh, 
sky sign. Well, they have actually got phenomena, though, haven't they? I mean, there's a methodology open to their use to establish chords of those phenomena, and they have got a fair crack of it. You know, it's not like you can say this isn't a phenomena. Why would we just study it as which? It's like, well, it is a phenomena. You just make up a story about it. Their story is not very good because they have the proponents on their own side saying this is the greatest mismatch of between theory and experiment in, in the history of science. That's pretty bad because they're talking about your cosmology, guys. Globers, the, the, the same guys who live in your cosmology, tell you it's a mismatch, the greatest one ever in the history of science. That's terrible. Maybe that's why you guys tell us now that science doesn't prove things, huh? Funny. Got a question from Sleeping Warrior, which I will ask at the end of uh, housekeeping questions. Any evidence of the distance of the sun? Nope. The sun, well, it isn't entirely a black body. Well, you need a radius for that, too. Yeah, that's true. We're going to need a radius for that distance. One of my patrons actually asked a question in regards to um, Venus and what exactly is it about the R value in Venus. And I responded, number one, Sleeping Warrior got all this information. I didn't do any research on it. But nevertheless, um, Venus is assumed by Christian Hugens to have the same R value as Earth, assumed to be a sphere with an R value. So you can apply Kepler's third law and get all the scaling values to give you the distance to the sun. Well, that requires you assume Venus is, quote, Earth's twin. So if you ever wondered, I wonder why they call it Earth's twin. Well, now you know why, because it's assumed to have the same exact R value as Earth, so that you can presuppose and get the scaling values. Because if you just have an apparent size of these things in the sky when they're traversing other things, you can't scale any of it. So you need to make a certain number of presuppositions in the heliocentric model to actually get to those values to give you those distances at 93 million miles for the sun. It's, and supposedly that's where we observe super rotation. So yeah, that makes sense. What? Super what? Super rotation. Yeah, that's the button on my blender. <laughs> You don't remember the citation I pull up whenever we're talking about how the atmosphere, uh, the air in the higher part of the atmosphere somehow stays lockstep with uh, the rest of the planet. And no. they say, yeah, we witnessed this. We don't know how this works, but we witnessed this on Venus. So it, it's all good. <laughs> it's the first law of thermodynamics violation. It'd have to increase the velocity of the unbonded gas that's claimed to be in lockstep, i.e. bonded with the ground beneath as it rotates. Well, it'd have to increase its velocity as it goes up higher because the circumference of the distance it's going to have to travel is going to increase as you go higher. Well, that means it's going to have to gain energy to stay in lockstep at a higher altitude. First law of thermodynamics violation. Can't just create energy out of nothing. It's complete horseshit anyway, because it's utilising a claim when you're describing Coriolis effect, which is supposedly proof we spin, even if you're talking about it in context of Venus with the same exact claim, that we see drift because the atmosphere isn't in lockstep. It's obviously not in lockstep. It's completely unbonded. That's what gas is, unbonded. So to say, well, it's bonded to Earth and moving with it, it's like, number one, that doesn't give you a Coriolis drift to show us 15 degrees an hour deviation to prove we spin. It's your explanation for why we don't have any proof we spin. Yeah, we'll just put the word super in front of it and it all checks out. That doesn't work, no. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth? Not even a little bit. Would we have to assume R for that? Yeah. Center a of a presupposed spherical Earth, molten iron core. Yeah, you'd need R for that. Is that it? Do we cover all of the housekeeping questions? I think we did. Oh, did no, you do any... gas pressure with 
I didn't. Any evidence you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? Well, what about atmospheric law? Atmosphere is an oxymoron. Atmo means air. Sphere is a fundamentalist religious presupposition that air, instead of taking the shape of its containment, takes the shape of a sphere arbitrarily around a marble they assume with an R value. So it'd be wrong on its face because the radius value uh, doesn't exist. Yeah. Can't have atmosphere sphere shaped air wrapped around a marble if you haven't got an r value for the marble to wrap it around in violation of the second law of thermodynamics i might add gas expands to fill the space it has available to it it's an entropy increase dispersion would occur we'd all be dead if the sky was a vacuum it's not space is fake so, Sleeping Warrior says, Nathan Oakley, 1980, can you answer a question my, quote, listening guest has for you, question mark. The question is, dot, 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 why does he run a show if the content is always the same, question mark. Well, the, I, number one, you can't possibly have every single show the same. That's impossible. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we are, for the most part, the Western world is under the impression we're on a sphere and we can demonstrate that to be false now until there's a case that everybody in the western world realizes they've been lied to or that it's just a religious belief or a philosophy then we have a place to point that out here i have a show as a result of that western world belief that they're on a sphere so it means i can bang the same drum all day long every day as for it being the same yeah we intentionally anthony riley being a main part of this created housekeeping questions to give consistency to the beginning part of the show, bearing in mind that most YouTube viewership, if you're a cursory viewer, will be short. In other words, they'll come for the first part of the show, then probably tune out, unless they're an avid watcher of the show and enjoy the entire show. Well, you want to get the main points across in the first part of the show, when it's a live show at least, so that people can understand that they're not on a sphere. It is a religious belief, or as I say, philosophy, model, that they've been sold from birth as their world and it isn't now i can as i say keep banging that drum all day long without any issues whatsoever and people will still come along and tell me i'm wrong because most of the people here in the western world think they're on a sphere and we're not hope that answers your question but when they tell you you're wrong are they coming with any evidence to show you where you're in error nathan Oh, often they think they have evidence. Evidence is proof. So to believe that you have evidence is to believe that you have proof of the contrary. Now, upon dismissal of their evidence by way of rebuttal and refu refutation, you can say, no, you didn't have any evidence. I got a question about that guy's question. How many times has he watched your show to say every episode is the same? Every episode can't be the same. That's an impossibility. That's what I'm saying. Like, is he an avid watcher? Is that what? And he's. I don't. I don't get the question. Listen, people have an issue with the housekeeping questions because they have an issue with the housekeeping questions, but they are necessary to be asked every day until we get an answer which will we'll never get an answer because Earth is flat. Well, I just want to point out that n no one, he well, no one actually said that they had a problem. Well, the person didn't say that they had a problem with the housekeeping questions. Or no, an but, issue no, with it but being... That is, that is a problem, though, I'm telling you. I've heard it before. That's what I'm trying to say. I know I would agree with you, Neil, and I would agree with Eli. It's not actually implied that that's why the question was asked. But ultimately speaking, there are plenty of people out there who say, oh, it's samey, we'd rather not have the housekeeping every day. It's not necessary. It's like, are you a globe believer by any chance? <laughs> have you answered these questions? <laughs> of course you haven't. I get plenty of kudos and thanks and support, financial support from people who like it, who say, yeah, I like the fact that you are banging that drum constantly. You're a voice for this deception that's consistent and there's going to be people who come here at a cursory glance and don't 
appreciate that we're doing this daily and we've heard every argument at least 100 times. They're still going to say, yeah, but don't you realise gravity? <laughs> we're going to go, yeah, we do. <laughs> we'll tell you all about it. Um, how many times uh, have you actually changed the housekeeping question? Like, Never. We've added to them a couple of times. So you've added new questions. You've never actually changed the form of the question? No, never. They've always remained the yeah, same. Yeah, you they have. Were, they, they, go on then. You had, a, you had to, well, you had to uh, add in the, uh, change the uh, axial rotation to the Earth-based variety, right? Yeah, that's because of Ranty. So every time I asked any yeah. evidence of axial rotation, you go, I got a bicycle or I got... You know, just describe something with axial rotation. And you're like, yeah, okay, of the Earth-based variety. Is that right, foreshadowing? Yeah. That's what I was talking <laughs> Some about. Numptiness. But no, other than that, I mean, they might have got refined in terms of the way that it's phrased ever so slightly. But realistically, no, they've not changed. You know, we added um, any single viable hypothesis from any of the fields of astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics because that is so poignant in terms of the globe claims. They're claiming they've got science for the globe. And if you deny that you're on a globe, you're called a science denier. Actually, remember at first that the first question was always uh, any signs of Earth curve, right? Now that's been changed uh, a little recently due to the geometric horizon being debunked and all that. So now that's why the, the first question is what it is now. But yeah, it's changed to any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as Earth curve as opposed to any signs of Earth curve, which is how, how that has subtly changed, you're right. Well, the only reason I ask is how long have you been asking these questions? And it seems a bit unreasonable that nobody's come with a decent answer. Like yeah. Four years now. I time. thought by now some scientists would come forward. You know, it, from it, if my memory serves correct, this kind of started with the whole thing with uh, what's his name, Paul, and the the molten iron core evidence that he was supposed to bring for Riley, something like that. Am I correct, Nathan? Yeah, Paul that's Boyd? how it started out. I mean, Paul Boyd, yeah, yeah, Paul Boyd, <laughs> correct. Guy. He said he got evidence for the molten iron core, but we were just too dumb to understand it, or something like that. Ultimately, it was Anthony's original idea, and then a lot of the questions were already being asked in a different way by Quantum Eraser, and they got formatted into an, something that we could continually ask. And yeah, they've changed subtly. I take it all back. I say they haven't. They have. Um, but the base of the question remains the same. It doesn't matter if I have to qualify the question a bit more these days. Geometric physical horizon as opposed to any evidence of Earth curve. And it's a qualifier that's worthy of being there because it's assumed automatically when you say either the horizon or earth curve that they are synonymous, that they are one and the same thing, in fact. And they're not. I think no. they even started no, off with uh, like Sleeping Warrior asking about Paul Voigt and like something like, are, is there any sign of Paul Void in this evidence for the Molten Iron Core? That I, actually might have been like the first question, to be honest, for, if my memory serves correct. Yeah, I'm that sounds about right, him saying any any signs of Paul Voigt with the evidence for the Molten Iron Core. So as much as the Molten Iron Core is the least favourite of my housekeeping questions, other than when once a month, maybe less, we get to talk about Thea, just drop it into the conversation because it's a farcical story that gets a laugh. But other than that, it's a really stupid question, if you ask me. But that was the first one, right? Anthony asking for Paul to provide his evidence. So that's why you kept it. I've, I've wondered why it stayed in the lineup since, you know, you have to make a bunch of presuppositions to even try to get to the molten iron core. Because it started with that one. And then as the show progressed, we would add on to it because other subjects would come up and then we would just add on to it we would start the show with any signs of paul void for the for a while it was that any signs of paul and his evidence of this core and then after a while we just dropped the paul part it just became any signs of the core and then other questions any signs of gravity and that's how that's how it turned into Why? what it is now because that was the end when we were doing that like the ballers or now the anti-flat earthers they literally came after us making even more of such claims. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that means I'm going to prove the curve now to you. So we just got this pick 
of these crazy fallacies of things that they thought they've proven, and then it turned into the housekeeping questions. Right. So wait a uh, second. Uh, what show was that? Like number wise. Oh, I don't. Because I don't remember that at all, and I came in around the late six hundreds, seven hundreds. Okay, we could reminisce about this, but instead, I'm going to read out Retro Bill super chat. So. If airplanes being flung by a rotating Earth are conserving momentum, thus resulting in no drift, then what on Earth would pilots need to correct for? Same for snipers, field goal kickers, etc. It's a, it's a good question, but slightly malformed. Thank you very much, first of all, for the Super Chat Retro Bill. I really appreciate the support. Now, correcting for Coriolis, this is a misnomer because... You can't, as a pilot, correct for Coriolis because Coriolis effect is only capable of being observed if you are rotating beneath the thing you are observing. So it's not like you can get a, an aeroplane pilot, get a call that says, ground control to pilot number 47, you have somebody watching you from a roundabout. Please correct your course. Obviously, somebody observing a plane look like it's drifting because they're on a roundabout wouldn't need correcting for. Now, the claim is Earth is that roundabout turning beneath anything not attached to give you 15 degrees an hour drift. So the cause of Coriolis deflection, that would be Earth turning beneath stuff, would cause problems for flights. Hence, we give the example if you've got Coriolis deflection observable from the ground, 15 degrees an hour drift, because Earth's turning beneath, then a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles would only take an hour and a half because Earth would be turning beneath it for you to observe the drift from the ground known as Coriolis effect. In reality, the flight takes four and a half hours because it's not turning beneath. That would be Earth isn't turning beneath the aeroplane to shorten the flight time. But it's claimed to be turning beneath a field goal so that you from the stand can observe it seem to drift. Well, that seeming to drift from the stand is Coriolis and is only capable of being observed as you turn beneath, not from the projectile. The trick, going back a couple of years, it hasn't come up recently, Retro Bill, but the trick is to get you to start detailing what happens to the projectile from the projectile's perspective. So what happens to the plane from the plane's perspective? Well, that's nothing to do with Coriolis. Coriolis is only capable of being detailed and described as you turn beneath. Or you can get a confession like that. It uh, would be uh, much ahead. worse if it was reality because the, the pilots wouldn't be correcting for an apparent drift. They'd be correcting for an actual spinning earth that they need to land the plane on. Can you show us the pilots that do that? Yeah, but if you push them hard enough, they give a good confession like hillbilly blue balls. And he says, but we're not on a roundabout, Nathan. Thank you very much. We agree. Earth is motionless. Yeah, that would be Blue Marble Science. Now, I took it from it. I don't watch Blue Marble Science, but somebody I am subscribed to had done uh, Flat Earth Tests. Subscribe today to Flat Earth Tests. Good videos. Um, but he'd done a response to Blue Marble where Blue Marble was obviously responding to me. And my explanation where I caught a cum virus out by saying okay so we're on a roundabout we're looking at an airplane we're going to see it drift right because we're on a roundabout looks like it's drifting because we're turning beneath it yes all good now let's transpose the exact same coriolis drift example onto earth we're gonna see the hot air balloon drift because we're turning beneath it aren't we well no we're not going to see it then it's like well then we haven't got this effect we haven't got coriolis well blue marble science's response to that would say well we're not on a roundabout it's like yeah but we claim to be we claim to be turning about an axis like a roundabout. That's what Globe Earth claims. But you've got to deny the claim that we're like a roundabout because we don't see the effect. What, what he really meant to say was we're not on a non-inertial reference frame. Yeah, but we need to be to see Coriolis deflection. Exactly. He's saying, oh, well, we're not on a roundabout that's non-inertial, turning beneath things to see drift. No, we're not. That's precisely the point. We're not seeing drift. We're not turning beneath stuff. We're not like a roundabout. Yeah, welcome to Stationary Earth, uh, big blue marble idiot. Great confession. Yeah, they have to go to anti-flat earth rhetoric where they deny their own claim in the first instance that the globe is making in order to combat a rebuttal from us where we demonstrate that we're not turning beneath stuff. We're supposed to be to give us Coriolis deflection at 15 degrees an hour. We don't experience it at all. It's occasionally exampled by the high priests with footballs going through goals in a curved trajectory as you watch them from the stand because Earth's claimed to turn beneath the ball. 
That's the actual claim from Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's what's supposed to happen. But it would also turn beneath aeroplanes and hot air balloons and drones and you if you jumped up and down. And we don't observe that effect. Quick shout out to <laughs> Godzilla37. Hi, ballers. Just super chatting Nathan again to make you happy. I'm sure I'll hear about it later, winky face. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for the super chat, Godzilla37. Still going to need a bar value for that axis. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we're halfway there. We've got Blue Marble Science saying we're not on a roundabout. It's like, yeah, just transpose that into the effect you're supposed to have when you see drift because you're on a roundabout Earth turning beneath stuff. To give you Coriolis effect, you're supposed to be on a roundabout. But we're not. We don't see drift. And his, also, his response was also to say, what the hell are you talking about? Why would we expect to see... 15 degrees an hour deviation in a hot air balloon, <laughs> as is claimed on the globe. Why would you expect that, you crazy idiot, said Blue Marble to me. Why would you expect to see 15 degrees an hour deviation as we turn beneath a hot, hot air balloon? I wouldn't expect to see that, Blue Marble. You would. But as you rightly point out, we're not on a roundabout turning beneath stuff to give us drift, as claimed by a globe. I don't think they think things through before they say something. Well, to add in the folklore pendulum, which the Earth is supposedly rotated or underneath it, which is very interesting that a hot air balloon can hover over the same spot for a few hours and still be in the same location. It just, I don't understand. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. Which bit doesn't make sense? Because we're not on around the belt. I was going to say, because we're not spinning beneath anything, but wh which bit specifically? Well, the, uh, being in a non-inertial reference frame, now they, they uh, you know, the ballers will jump in and add, oh, the earth is in lockstep or not fully lockstep. They don't know. They can't make up their mind that the uh, weather balloon or hot air balloon will be rotating with the earth, which will be an inertial reference frame now. But it, it doesn't make sense. But the folklore pendulum, I call it the folklore pendulum, is in a non-inertial reference frame. So that can spin. But the weather balloon, that does it just doesn't make sense. Okay, so the pendulum is swinging back and forth. All pendulums do is swing back and forth. Back and forth, back and forth. They don't drift. They don't move in a figure of eight. They don't deviate. They move back and forth. That's the inherent property of a pendulum. Now, that pendulum is moving back and forth in the inertial reference frame. However, right. you are claimed to be standing on the non-inertial reference frame. So you're watching it seem to drift and knock over the dominoes. It's not really drifting, it's just moving backwards and forwards. And Earth is claimed to turn beneath it at 15 degrees an hour to cause the apparent, because it's only moving back and forth, what do you mean only moving back? It's obviously knocking over the dominoes. No, no, that's Earth claim to be turning beneath it. Coriolis deflection. Inertial and non-inertial reference frames drift observed from the non-inertial in the inertial as you turn beneath. That would be an effect that would cause hot air balloons to drift away at 15 degrees an hour because you're turning beneath them. You, on a non-inertial claim to be spinning reference frame of an Earth that spins like a roundabout, and the hot air balloon not attached to it, drifting away as you turn beneath it. That doesn't happen. So then we're asked, you crazy idiot, why would you, the flat earther, expect to see Earth turn beneath a hot air balloon? Uh, I don't. That's a globe claim that doesn't happen. But we get charged with expecting to see drift, like we're ever going to claim it as flat earthers. No, we don't claim to expect to see drift. You do, it just doesn't happen. The globe claims we will have drift, it just doesn't happen. And when we, the Flat Earthers, point out it isn't happening, you ask us why we would expect to see it. Right. Uh, yeah. It's just a bunch of double speak. I think the two main misconceptions Globers have about Coriolis, one is that it, it's a force, and the second being that uh, an object has to be moving in the non-inertial reference field, i.e. if an object is just hovering like a balloon or a, or a drone, it wouldn't experience Coriolis. Yeah, no worries. So we break that down. You put a drone on a roundabout 
And just so I can make the example a bit later, I'll say that on this roundabout, you've got two maps, sellotape to the bottom of the roundabout. One's got England on it and one's got Japan on it. And you launch the drone. According to the example you've just given from a flat, uh, an anti-flat Earth perspective, you would say that the drone then follows along with the England part of the map when it's not attached to the roundabout. Therefore, we do not see the drift of the drone anymore. It moves with the roundabout. Somehow is moving along with the roundabout when it's hovering. That's what you're saying. Total nonsense and a non-drift claim. Uh, what would you say to people who call it a force? From I mean, the, it's, it's measured it the, in newtons, isn't it? Look it up. It's an illusion. An apparent yeah, meaning, terms. seeming but not actual effect. I.e., when described with a roundabout, with my drone and the maps on the roundabout, sellotape to them, you push the up stick on the drone, it launches and hovers. And the roundabout continues to rotate beneath. If you are on the roundabout, looking at the drone hovering, the drone would appear to be flying towards you. Now, the drone isn't actually flying towards you. It's the not actual force of Coriolis that makes it seem like it's flying towards you when in fact it's hovering and you are rotating towards it. The effect you observe is the not actual force of Coriolis making the drone fly towards you. Yeah, and this is this is how they confuse people, right? They call it a, a fictional or pseudo force. I mean, why would you even call it a force? And why would you measure it in newtons? I'll tell you. Actual. Well, I'll tell yes. you. Yeah. I'll tell you. Because you can actually observe this effect. The reason it's described as apparent is because you can see it. It appears. So you see, if I give you a different example, well, no, let's stick with the same example. You've got the drone and it's hovering above the roundabout at about head height and you rotate towards it. Well, from your position, it just looks like the drone's flying towards you and you go, oh no, the drone's coming towards me, smack. And it hits you in the head. Well, what force, in quotes, caused the drone to fly towards you? It didn't. It just seemed that way. Well, the force that you observed, because you did see it happen, it flew towards you, is the Coriolis force. A not actual force, but it still caused a drone to seem like it was flying towards you from your perspective. From your vantage point, the drone flew towards you. Like if you're a travelator and you hold your hand in the air, it looks like the sign above the travelator comes towards you and gives you a high five. When in reality, you're moving towards it. But from your perspective, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you hit it with your hand. But it's really not moving. Well, the effect of it getting bigger and bigger and bigger and coming towards you is akin to the Coriolis deflection. A not actual effect just seems like it. That's why it's described as a force. Not just that, I think, um... With regards what? to Newtons, no, you can't measure it. You, you calculate Newtons. Well, if you have an observer uh, standing outside of the merry-go-round, right, and they're observe, they'll be in a non-inertial reference frame, while the uh, person on the merry-go-round throws, a, you say, a tennis ball straight out in the horizontal path, uh, the non-inertial reference frame observer will see a parabolic flight, while the person on the merry-go-round will see a straight path while the merry-go-round is rotating underneath it they won't see that but the person in the not inertial reference ring will see that you got it wrong way around halfway through but yes yeah the, per the person on the non-inertial rotating reference frame who throws the ball will see a parabolic trajectory of the ball because they're moving away from it after they release it the person who's not right. on the roundabout watches the ball just go up and down yeah yeah i got it okay Meanwhile, none of those effects happen on an Earth that's claimed to be turning, and we would notice. You'd notice if you threw a ball in the air and it drifted away at 15 degrees an hour, that would be a 1,000 miles an hour on the equator. You'd notice that. Doesn't happen, so we don't notice, because we're not turning beneath anything. We're not having the example 
validated by evidence that we can see occurring. And when we point out that we haven't got the claim that we spin validated by evidence we see occurring, we're told by anti-flat earthers, why would you expect to see drift? You hold your hands in the air as a flat earther and go, I don't expect to see drift. I'm pointing out that we don't and you do expect to see it. It just doesn't happen on a globe because we're not on a globe and we're not rotating. Right. Remember back in the day when Danny showed up here and he was telling us how somebody's on a uh, merry-go-round and they're throwing a ball? Well, apparently that ball doesn't leave the non-inertial reference frame because somebody else that's not on the merry-go-round looking at it is still seeing it. So therefore, it hasn't left any reference frames. Remember that beautiful argument? <laughs> uh, I I do. This is a dangerous topic, though. Like, if you don't know how to beg the question right, you can get confused in the lingo. Indeed. So I would like to arm my audience with a very useful, very quick, very sharp sword to chop the head off anybody who claims that we've got an axial rotation of the Earth-based variety. Well, John, what, what could we possibly offer um, uh, the audience in that regard? can't have an axis without a radius. One. Okay, Adam. Yes, sir. You sent me an email saying that you wanted me to discuss begging the question, proof of nothing, perspective hijacking Earth curve calculator, and the slightly looming non standard refraction high in a holographic projection of things like lighthouses from behind the formerly reified geometric sphere edge horizon. What specifically did you want me to detail about any aspect of that very long description? Well, first of all, to get the full description out correct is a skill in itself. Um, really, I'm just, just wanting you to explain uh, the fundamentals of why we say all of those things. Um, a little bit like the housekeeping questions, I suppose, with what you were saying earlier. It kind of built up over time as one ball or brought another claim that kind of got incorporated into the description a little bit okay so i suppose it's just to break those little bits down and who added each bit um and why uh, you know fundamentally that explains why we say that big uh, okay let's do it. words so begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator and the slightly looming non-standard refraction high in a holographic projection of a lighthouse from behind the reified sphere edge horizon. Let's break all of that down. Begging the question because it's assumed in the title of the maths. Earth curve calculator. So they're already assuming that this observation is comparable to their assumption of earth curve. Therefore, it's begging the question. Proof of nothing. It's got an R value in it and we've debunked it. So you can't assume your R value in R, you trust is no longer applicable. You don't have one. Without an R value, it's literally proof of nothing. Perspective hijacking. We've got the Rayleigh criteria at 1.22 over lambda. That's not the correct maths. Adam, reel off the, <laughs> the Rayleigh criterion. I don't know off the top of my head. All right, yeah, 1.22 times uh, lambda over the D, A distance. Aperture size. Yeah. yeah, I did know it. I should trust myself. Right, so you've also got 1.22 times the square root of the observer's height in feet in the Earth curve mathematics, which are in a perspective omitting orthographic representation. That would be to say that you see the side of your own head when you're observing a target that in a photograph would not include you seeing the target in the same frame. And this has the effect of allowing the observation to have feet and inches applied to the target or meters which don't change with distance so if you can visualize standing next to a lighthouse with a 200 meter height and you look up you have to crane your neck to look at the top of it well if that's at 10 miles away it'll be on the horizon you're not craning your neck anymore you're looking at 90 degrees but it's still 200 meters right well no it's angular size, it's apparent size. That would be, again, appearing but not actual. Actual being feet and inches or meters. Has changed with distance. But their perspective hijacking Earth curve calculator 
puts it into what we call Muppet vision. Why Muppet vision? Because you see the side of your own head. Well, that is a way of removing the perspective. Moreover, hijacking perspective to call the horizon Earth curve. So, that's that first section in terms of begging the question, proof of nothing, perspective, hijacking, Earth curve calculations. Then we've got slightly looming, an old description from the rumpus in regards to how you know something is refracted because of its position with respect to the horizon. End quote. It would be, again, quote, slightly looming. Now, Tim Osman presented a piece of information or an image that had hyenas in the mid foreground that should have been behind a physical geometric sphere edge. So, obviously, the question arose, are these slightly looming non-standard refraction hyenas that are no longer behind a physical geometric sphere edge? And, of course, they were slightly looming hyenas. So, hence, we have the slightly looming non-standard refraction hyena holographic projection. That would be to say what you see is definitely not what you get when you're looking at a clock in the distance or a lighthouse in the distance. It's actually a mirage, a projection, a light show of something that you can't really see. And how do you know? Well, because it's refracted with respect to the horizon, a geometric tangent point. So your slightly looming non-standard refraction hyena holographic projection of a lighthouse or a clock from beyond the now debunked physical geometric sphere edge horizon as i whisper black swan which you no longer have so there you go there's the full description of why we have a slightly looming non-standard refraction high in a holographic projection of a clock from behind the reified sphere edge horizon as per the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator i thank you well, thank I don't you think very they're... much nathan <laughs> I don't know, they, they don't really have the actual description of what lumen is. Ballers can't even explain it. That it's just where the sky, the apparent sky reflects off the apparent water or the position of the water. Yeah, but that isn't what Rumpus was claiming previously. So that's the, how the anti flat earth rhetoric comes in now. That's how he's banned. He yeah, yeah, that's the lie. Yes, the lie about it. Where it was formerly, you know it's refracted because of its position with respect to the horizon. Now the horizon is also refracted, according to them. Formerly, the edge that was blocking things, now a non-physical position that only exists in the maths. Well, as a direct consequence of, of us debunking are, they now, this would be rumpus, has to lie about what they formerly claimed about the physical geometric obstruction at the horizon that is known as Earth Curve. Now, I quote... The geometric horizon only exists in the maths. Formerly blocked the Isle of Man, though, didn't it? Hence the lies that have to be told. Which is what I think that the horizon also looms now, making a paradoxical uh, mess for the rumpus that he can't get out of. Yeah, a paradoxical mess because you can't loom the horizon because they're looming, in quotes, is terrestrial refraction that would be seven over six of the radius and the radius is derived from the geometric horizon and in order to make the maths function you need a tangent to do the geometry and the tangent point is the horizon so you can't refract the horizon with a with an r value that's derived from the horizon it becomes paradoxical correct adam any more for any more no. With that, I'll say if you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. So a huge, massive, enormous thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed and joined as a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. Once again, stay tuned if you're watching on either programming stream. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video.
presents and this is this is why we go to school and we like we hate it because it's not like when you watch it on tv it's like but this is boring though this is trash but anyway back to my point so like in the show you have all these brilliant people saying brilliant things uh answering brilliant questions you know with with tests or whatever they're doing right so then I'm listening to Nathan talk today. And as I'm listening, I'm like, this is logical. This all makes sense. And if it didn't, shouldn't there be something, you know, that's like, you know, or um, someone come out, right? I'm just saying like the way it looks on TV, I would expect that response to us for me to be like well obviously it's a globe like because you've shown me all this awesome shit that obviously proves it like they would do on the show what do you mean on TV? Yeah, there's no one out here Hold on. there's no one out here actually doing any of that there are people what? saying dumb things to us what do you mean can't. by hold on hold on, hold on. What, what do you mean by on tv do you mean when it's like contrived and polished and edited and it's a super slick response that just says obviously whoosh, stupid flat earther here's our very quick fire nicely edited polished response that completely oh. annihilates your claim is that what you mean no no i i was talking about how i watched the show black lightning and they have scientists like on, on any of these superhero shows like i know obviously they with the the meta humans it's like you know fantasy yeah the flash but, is a big example of that yeah but but it but it's always like embedded in it that there's a portion of it that is real like because they're talking about physics and they're they're talking about science and doing experiments right and this is the part of it that people might take away and say well yeah that part is kind of real up until the point where they like you know manipulate dna to make people fly but the other thing is true scientists being in the lab and blah 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 and i'm just saying if that world was really true then i would expect some kind of show like response to the flat earth from the scientists that would have said here's how we scientifically prove that this is the heliocentric universe well they have they've attempted to do that while using us as hostile witnesses so they've taken the behind the curve documentary and said here you go here's flat earth is proving it's a sphere they're showing we've got 15 degrees an hour drift i mean very clever to utilize the most convoluted argument in that respect because even if you did dig into it you probably wouldn't get any further to an answer in regards to whether or not we do or don't spin and how it's proven with Coriolis to dr drift under a fiber optic gyro you know it's a complicated subject matter but the preface of the show or the premise that the show is presenting is to say they have proved we spin they being us and also uh, they say that jaron proved the earth curve in that documentary too <laughs> yeah i like they lied about the apparent uh the boat with stripes um even though you could see the apparent horizon past the boat and you could still see the stripes apparent horizon that's natural you're talking about national geographic's black swan aren't you yes yeah that was part of it yeah so they i mean if you ignore the one where they faked it with a helicopter that was clearly claimed to be behind earth curve and then they'd edited it in to be above it with the same ducks going past if you ignore that one they've also got the national geographic one where they've got a load of flat earthers at the beach and they're showing that you've got a flag that's seeming to lose the bottom stripe so it's got three or four stripes and the bottom one's disappearing and they're going well that's obviously because it's going behind earth curve nobody mentions optical phenomena whatsoever or any detailed explanations of any alternatives other than the assumption that because you're missing the bottom of this flag on a boat at distance earth curves get in in the way it's like yeah but you've also got the horizon behind the boat the <laughs> you've got the horizon the thing that's supposed to be earth curve in your maths your geometric horizon limitation to your view isn't actually the thing obscuring it. it's just got a bit of the flag missing but yet the horizon's beyond the boat definitely not earth curve actually a demolishment of earth curve assertions because it's a black swan nathan, 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 nathan. the oh. distance of the um 
flag wasn't even subject to any blockage by alleged earth curvature either. It wasn't far enough away uh, with their observer. See, I, I, think that, oh, hold on. I think oh, that's no, Eli's no, point. Right? There's too many people talking. Hold yes, on, hold on, hold on. One at a time. Just let Adam get to the end of his point. He's begging the question on their behalf, which is their position, and saying, based on their begging the question, they wouldn't have had Earth curve at that distance anyway. Can you just repeat the end of your point, though, Adam? No, no, that that, that was the point. So they're they're making the claim that that look, this is this is being blocked. They've made the positive statement that the thing that's blocking it is Earth curve in in there. What they don't show and demonstrate is any of the maths with it on, which actually would demonstrate that there is no blockage at this point, even if you did presuppose Earth curve. Uh -huh. But they did. They did. That's the for, like before we get back to my point. They did because in the video they say now um, at three miles, this is where the um, Earth will begin to block the uh, flag because obviously they're talking about the geometric position of the horizon. That's what they were talking about. So they did uh, cite the math. But it just didn't happen. And that's what I mean. That's my point. In movies and in shows, it, it's it's so fantastic and it's so wow. That was that was brilliantly written. That was done well. But in real life, that yeah. happened. That that's what that's what you say, right? Like in real life, if that was real, then somebody smart like Barry Allen would have figured out, hey guys, that's not where the, the geometric horizon is supposed to start. That, that flag is actually, that stripe is being cut off by what? Because the horizon's in the back. You would have somebody smart figure that out. But meanwhile, in real life, the, the, the very people who are the subject matter experts at this crap show us this as proof of earth curves. It's insane, bro. <laughs> I, I get your point. I love when you get excited, like chocolate. I like to point out the fact <laughs> it's freaking hilarious to be, man. Hold on, hold on chocolate. Go like ahead, Don. I'd like to point out the fact that they were claiming that there was two and a half stripes hidden, which uh, it was only half, barely even half due to the waves and perspective, which got them in a bind anyways, and they were caught. It's plain and simple. <laughs> and not one person was there like, hey, guys, hey, uh, you got a horizon in the back. <laughs> we right out there, there, guys. They were all active anyway. <laughs> they they could that have. That is true. Yes. Who was the wrestler? Three black they got, swans, they got right? for that? <laughs> yes. So Hold on, yes, Adam. Three black yes. Swans. Yes, that's correct, Adam. So they, they've gone away pre Black Swan and done something um, which will later just de 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 just demonstrate that they don't, as Elijah's saying, they don't actually know what they're doing. They're not actually applying. They're just grasping at trying to make a. Uh, anything to actually prove their point not even doing it with detail so not analyzing it properly not pointing out there is a horizon out there but oh look there's a bit of blockage that'll do it and if realistically that is what they came up with when asked to demonstrate their model that's still wasn't anything wow wasn't any top scientists coming out giving us real proof it was let's go down to the beach um that's quite an indictment that that's the best that National Geographic brought out as ball proof. Yeah, and it was a black swan. So post black swan, obviously, it was then sighted. You're like, what is a black swan? Well, it's where the horizon is beyond what is claimed to be the geometric limitations of a sphere edge radius 3959. Well, in this instance, you've got a claim that earth curves getting in the way of a boat. It's blocking the bottom of it so you can't see the flag. And yet there the horizon is behind it. How did you like my uh, summing up of the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator and the slightly looming non-standard refraction high in a holographic projection of a lighthouse or clock from behind the reified sphere edge, Adam? Any good? It's exactly it's what I wanted, mate. Right? <laughs> um, let's say I'm doing episode two of What is the World? Um, so I'm going to do it on curvature. It's going to have a bit of me and you from years ago me with short hair um are you going to use chocolate song what is the world as like the uh premiering yeah. well, it's the title tune mate for everything now that's it it's as long as he don't try and copyright me i'm good to go what's that
to add into that, you can actually uh, out of a state that is the most accurate uh, description, which they draw an imaginary quote unquote line through the continents. I kind of find it quite hilarious. I missed the beginning of that. I think. It's the GOI model, which is supposed to be the most accurate depiction of the uh, spherical Earth, where they draw an imaginary line through the continents. Imaginary. Why would they put that word in the definition of GOI? Hmm. Well, the whole thing's imaginary, isn't it? WGA, it's imaginary to try and make it flat. That's why you're always on the top of your flattened ellipsoid. Where no matter where you start your measurements from, um, in reality, you're on the top of that ellipsoid. Well, that actually, you can get away that you're on the top of a ball, but you can't always be on the top of an ellipsoid. So it's like no matter where you go, there you are? So you always start your measurements on the flattest point of your, of your ball, yeah? So it's giving, it gives you apologetics straight away. Everywhere you go, there you are. You like that, Neil? <laughs> yeah, everywhere you go, there you are. I think you should make a rap. Right, hopefully there aren't any Globers listening. If you want to know what they've got as the closest, um, in air quotes, model, type into Google, figure, F-I-G-U-R-E, of the Earth. I'm just going to read out what it says. Figure of the Earth is a term of art in geodesy that refers to the size and shape used to model Earth. The size and shape it refers to depends on context, including the precision needed for the model. The sphere is an approximation of the figure of the Earth that is satisfactory for many purposes. Hmm. A lot of choice words in there. A lot of weaselage in there. That's what I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> I wonder what are satisfactory for many purposes. Uh, the purpose being to mug you off to think it's a ball. Yeah. If you're going to model Earth as a sphere, then that is satisfactory. <laughs> uh, I like how it's based on the context, though. <laughs> it's, it's cute. But it depends how much precision you need. Obviously, if you actually need to work on the ground, then you're going to use something like Google Earth and it's going to show absolutely no elevation change, no eight inches per mile squared drop. It's just going to show it all as flat or an ordnance survey map. You know, it's going to show it as navigatably flat because that's what it is. If you need that level of accuracy, then you're not going to have any Earth curve drop. Wait, the size and shape it refers to Depend on context. Oh, I thought it was a defined ball in space. Well, but contextually, the size of the model depend on how you want to use it. Then, yeah, that that was the first thing that caught my my ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, contextually, if you're going to stick it on a mobile above a child's head, then it doesn't need to be that accurate, right? Just needs to brainwash them. It was Chris Monk that told me that, or, or pointed me in that direction. And if you don't know what you don't know, you don't know, right? You haven't got a clue what you're looking for. When it's contextualised in that manner, using words like model, even if you got there, you might not necessarily know what that contextually means when they're talking about modelling things. You go, all right, okay, well, that means it's the world then. No, you've just fell victim to a reification fallacy you weren't even aware you were doing just by reading off the words... Because they're magic, aren't they? Well, Nathan, you don't know what you don't know, but at least you know what you don't know. No, you don't know what you don't know. That's the problem. That's Dunning-Kruger. When you don't know what you don't know, and you have an excessive amount of confidence about what you think you know, when you don't know what you don't know, that's literally what Dunning-Kruger describes. You know what the best part of this is, though? I don't know, man. When, when you put it in figure of the earth, they give you this, that, that potato-looking blob. Then you got a perfect sphere. Then you got a geor. It's like, which one, which one is it? I could just scroll. How many earths are there, guys? Depends on the context, chocolate. 
Just depends on context. Depends on the context. Yeah. Including the precision needed for the model. Which yeah. would you which you would already have had you had gone through scientific experiment. So it kind of seems like you're working ass backwards. I don't know. Wait. <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, you're working bass backwards. <laughs> It'd look pretty funny if it was forward. Well, maybe I should <laughs> there he is. Go on. You don't understand what you don't understand, but at least you can understand what you don't understand. Where you go, there you are. <laughs> oh, you made it worse now. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Oh, and how do you know whether you're going to understand it or not understand it if you don't even know it? I thought what he meant it was that... No, you know, oh, you're cross-mixing knowing and understanding not... now. That's not fair. <laughs> He's right, though, isn't he? <laughs> <That's not fair. laughs> He's got a point. He's clever. That's clever. There's a difference between knowing things and understanding things. Right, Arwen? Yes. Yes, there is. Arwen's nice. I think that's what Arwen was talking yeah. about with uh, gravity. I like to understand... Oh, uh, that you know what... Go ahead, Don. All right, cool. Um, there's times where I uh I'm drifted into it and then I pull back out, but I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks this that flat Earth could be a psyop, not a psyop like as in bad, like it's being trickled into society little by little because they just can't withhold the information, so they got to release it little by little. Am am I the only one that sees that, or no? No, Flat Earth is a reality. It depends how you contextualize it. Yes, I would agree with you. It depends on the day and which hat I'm wearing. But yeah, I can put that hat on very easily. You know, you've only got to look at things like the Flat Earth Society and the language that we use in our argumentation against the globe. Just take atmosphere for an example. Part of the vernacular that's been developed by way of presupposition and sphere belief. It's just part of the language, right? I'm sure plenty of people here have said the atmosphere without giving it a second thought that you're actually begging the question of a sphere-shaped air in violation of natural law. But it's just part of the language, isn't it? So is it a psyop in that regards? Well, yeah, it's become part of the language and it's self-perpetuating now. So on the one hand, you could say it's intentionally put out there by this individual. And you go, yeah, you can't really dispute that they've said it. But have they done it with any malice of forethought? No. So how can you describe that as a lie? Well, you can't. They're not intentionally deceiving you. That's just what, what they've done to grow up. Well, how has that become prevalent? Well, at some point it was introduced, you can look at the history, by the church. Well, when it was introduced by the church as the new, <laughs> the new hotness, the new world, one world religion, if you will. Well, at that point, it's then permeated its way through society from the top down, like anything else that makes its way into society. Well, that in and of itself is a psyop. And the contrasting views that are kept in ridicule are also very easy to track back to their sources. Same with the arguments that we're fed. So if we're going to argue about how the horizon is earth curve, how is that the case? Well, it's because it's been argued as earth curve. So therefore, when we fall victim to claiming that it should or shouldn't bend at altitude, that's going to be part of the argumentation that's filtered its way in from the controlled narrative. So you've got Flat Earth Society who will put in those arguments and have people like, no offence to him, Eric DeBay, say they often have good arguments on the Flat Earth Society website. They say the horizon rises to eye level, and that's true. It's like, no, you've missed the bigger trick. Because now you, as a Flat Earther, are using the horizon, which is a reified sphere edge, to argue about how much it does or doesn't bend and how much it does or doesn't bend at altitude, missing the fact that it's not a physical sphere edge to fall off with a boat that you measure in your earth curve maths while they simultaneously show us boats falling off a pizza pie and give us a load of flat earth quote unquote maps that are actually azimuth equidistant globe projections all of that stuff has come from and you can track back and easily verify from the sources of the globe a lot of them are labeled globe it's a globe projection that we are deemed as having to justify as a flat earth bloody map so you can't really not say it's come from controlled opposition. It has. There's no two ways about that. But most of what we deal with isn't that. The, the effects of it are already in place, and the people we deal with are just doing it um, matter-of-fact anyway. Not lying makes it far more difficult to combat 
when they're automatically assuming that they're correct because they know it done in Kruger. How are you supposed to combat that? Well, you don't because they end up in cognitive dissonance and still fight for their cause with a position that isn't actually correct to their globe claim. Why? Well, because they already know and it can't possibly be the case that we've proven it wrong. Well, that's very useful for the person that originally put all of those narratives out, especially if the person they're fighting against on the flat earth side is arguing about how their model works. Well, who gave them the model? <laughs> you know, that's how it's controlled. You just got to know where the pitfalls are. Well, hopefully that's what this show does, right? We point out where the pitfalls lie. Be specific, Nathan, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, okay, yeah, the Roman Catholic Church. All roads lead to Rome. This is no exception. Mm -hmm. Right, well, part of the belief and go, the power are. of the organization that comes from <laughs> all as well as the Catholic original church, right, goes for self-compartmentalization. And then just trusting there is a body of work, body of chance, a body of science, and they provide, they must be right, because why else would it all be there? And then you lean on that superficial personal trust. And then the only way to really point it out is, well, go and look at the works that you believe in. And then they'll, like ballers do, scatter gun you with every single argument argument that you have to refute every single time because they'll just move on. Right? And then they'll forget all about it, that it ever happened, so they can do it over again. You know what's funny? When I was in, oh, when I hold on, Neil's trying to get away. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead, Neil. I heard you first. Go ahead. When I, when I was growing up, I, I went to Roman Catholic school, and I couldn't understand why they were teaching us about Jesus and creation. And then the next page, we were learning about um, evolution and all things like that, and heliocentrism. But I knew as a child that I was being deceived, but you can't really like put your finger on it, but you know something's not right. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, chocolate. No, I, uh, because of what I always said, I just wanted to say shout out to the body of science. Shout out, retracted. On a slightly different note, um, I just had a massive flash of lightning followed two or three seconds later by a massive, really loud bang of thunder, and then followed half a second later by the kids in the playground, which is 200 yards from me, all screaming at exactly the same time. It was really funny. Nice. Everywhere you go, there you are. Huh. Is that a lightning bang? I hope so. Might be some evolution happening back there. Watch out. Oh, shit. Yeah, just to get that back on track. Yeah, why did it come from there, Neil? Well, because they are the ones that came up with it in the first place. That's why. No, but it's funny because as a kid, you realize you know something. Even like with the whole Santa Claus thing. I stood up all night and waited for Santa Claus, and he never came. But there was gifts under the tree, so that I knew was bull crap. But that's what this whole heliocentric nonsense is. It's believing in Santa Claus. Yeah, but we still try and assign it to the people who actually perpetrated it in the first instance whenever we talk about their quasi-experiments, for example, Cavendish. You know, when you're trying to make a claim that's supposed to be validating something that the guy whose namesake is above the title, I Newton, didn't want it ascribed to him. So instead, we call it CV Boys, Reverend John Michelle Cavendish Gravity. Well, the Reverend John Michelle bit is in the middle, so it doesn't necessarily pop out too much. It just, you know, it's there in the wings, right, to point out, well, who, who is it actually came up with this crap? Well, it's come from your priests. Now, your priests have now got different types of waistcoats on now, haven't they? But they're still priests. More specifically, it's from the Society of Jesus, the a.k.a. the Jesuit Order. Well, it's funny, though, when I looked into and read into the Cavendish non-experiment, that he wasn't even measuring for Big G anyways. I don't know what this is on about, about G. That's right. Measuring for density, right? The density of the Earth? Well, hold on. That's why CV Boys is in there. It's CV Boys that gets his name mentioned for that reason. Yeah, but in the papers, he discovered gravity. It's in the papers. What's the name of that paper again? The papers, the papers. I'm going to look at the papers, get the papers. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what was the name of that paper, then? I think it was something like Weighing of... the Mass of Earth or something like that. It was uh, Experiments to Measure the Density of the Earth. Measure. Yeah, so I'm like... Hmm. Measure? Whoo! Is that a time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Experiments? Experiments? I, IVDV? <laughs> oh, was that time? Let's get out of here. <laughs> so what's the numeric value of their independent variable again? Mass. Listen, math, math. math. Science is the study of numbers. <laughs> According to Rumpus. <laughs> their, their hypothesis is if mass, then mass attracts mass. There you go. That was funny. That That's funny. Science, science is the study of numbers. <laughs> Take on attention. That'd be awesome, What's man. the independent variable of that number? <laughs> the number itself. Or maybe the combination of the previous number is the cause. I think they were doing something. I mean, what, what did they think they were doing? Didn't they know science? Didn't they know that you needed an independent variable, an observed phenomena? Didn't they know that? You're kind of asking us to divine their thoughts in that regard. Yeah. Maybe the citations that show that they were aware of it, but we'd have to work pretty long and hard to establish yes, this. Yes, I am. I don't you know. You think they're the ones who came up with it. Given there's no established IVDV relationship in the papers, <laughs> I'm going to say in this in this specific example, no. But only because if you were to look through it for an independent variable, it wouldn't state it. Well, I, I, I have I heard, for not science. Well, right, I have Glover's around the Cavendish experiment due to the electrostatics. Um, I don't know how accurate that is. I have not seen anybody ground it, or even blue marble. I have not seen that to be the case. Okay, let's try and break this down for you. It's been a few months. Maybe I should tell QE to drop anchor on the scientific method on ball busters. I'll have a chat with him. If you can comprehend what is required to be called science. Now, science is specific in this realm, i.e. on this show, or in this deb debate arena, because we're talking about the natural world. So we are talking specifically about natural science, which is defined. So the elucidation of the cause of an effect observed in nature. The observed phenomena is the effect you observe in nature. Therefore, the process is really specific in terms of what is going to happen at what time. And the first thing that must happen is there's got to be something to study. What causes that leaf falls from tree what caused that to happen why did that occur that occurrence is the effect that's what you're going to be studying so in this instance leaf falls from tree that's my effect my dependent variable well we're already halfway there to formulating a hypothesis what's our hypothesis you say well it's a scientific prediction it predicts is a supposition of the cause of the effect that you're studying. So, step one, dependent variable, observe phenomena. The effect, what's happening and why is it happening? First, you've got to see something happening. It's got to be real. You've got to observe it actually occurring. Yeah? Then you say, I think X caused the leaf to fall from the tree. That would be your supposition of cause. Not yet validated. But then you've got it all. You've got a scientific prediction. If X, then leaf falling from tree. Yeah. You've also, in a hypothesis prediction, got the antithesis of your presumed cause of the effect. That would be if X not falling from tree. So you don't get the phenomena even though you vary your presumed cause. Now, that particular part of it, the null, makes the method when actualized empirical because at the end of the process one or other of those two things will be validated 
either you vary x and the leaf falls or you vary x and the leaf doesn't fall. But both of those things are in your hypothesis. So at the end of the experiment, that's the actualization of the hypothesis, that would be to vary x and see if it causes the leaf to fall, that's an experiment. But if it doesn't cause the leaf to fall, you have then validated your null hypothesis because you had it written down if x not leaf falling. So therefore that section of the null of the hypothesis called the null is validated upon experimentation. More often than not, that's what will happen. <laughs> you don't get it right, basically. But it's a but you still validated something. So it isn't that then. You validated it wasn't the cause. Yeah? So that's what gives the method empiricism. Now, all of that taken into consideration, first step of this method is to observe a phenomena like my leaf falling. So then we move back to, after that very lengthy explanation, Cavendish experiment. So you're saying some people have said that the electromagnetic, blah, blah, blah. blah. Hold on. What's being studied? <laughs> Before we start worrying about what's causing it, what's the phenomena that's being studied in the Cavendish. I ask you. I think it was Don that asked this. So it's a uh, mass attracting mass. The two lead balls are supposedly attracting to each ah, other. Ah, don't, ah, yeah. don't get ahead of yourself about balls. So do we observe balls yeah. in nature attracting each other? No. no. Perfect. None. No. So None. where... Okay. So if that's the claimed phenomena, then you've got to show me it occurring in nature. Where do we observe... Mass attracting mass in nature. Uh, just while you're looking for that, I'll release this helium balloon and put my kettle on and watch the steam go upwards. <laughs> yeah, you know, we don't... Well, they'll one. say that we're, we're, we're attracted to the Earth. That's why we're grounded. Yeah, let's go of helium balloon. So, mass attracting mass is the phenomenon. So, before you start concerning yourself with the causes of man-made contraptions, which is essentially the phenomena being studied in the apparatus... So the phenomena isn't a phenomena. It's not naturally occurring. Therefore, the phenomena is man-made. You've got a man-made gizmo that does something. And the question that's being asked is, why does the man-made gizmo do this? Why do the balls attract each other in the man-made gizmo? Who cares? A man made it. It's not something occurring in nature that you need to study with science. Why? Well, because if you put it through the process, the independent variable is man-making it. You already know the cause. Yeah, that's I feel like correct. it's been a long time since we've had to ask questions like that. Like, where do we see lead balls attracting each other in nature? Like, I guess they've foregone that and now just go with, oh, uh, you know, where, where is, definitions don't, are meaningless. So, yeah, let's just go with that. <laughs> so, Nathan, the way you explain that, then science does prove things. That's all it does. You made a nice uh, actual point on that because when you were we were talking about the uh, Michael Stone, like, morally uh, non-experiment because man, it's man-made. Man makes the drift. Man manipulates it. Man is the cause. Yes, makes sense. Yeah, you gotta have a natural yeah, phenomenon to see it. Right? So just, just exactly you can't just to around... create something. And then see the thing, see a phenomenon in the thing that you created, and then be like, oh, there, there it is. I created but... a phenomenon. <laughs> no, it's backwards. Yeah. So to summarize the steps, because you've heard them all now. Step one, observe natural phenomena. Step two, formulate hypothesis. That's your prediction of the phenomena's cause. Step three, actualization of hypothesis. That would be experimentation. So step one, phenomena. Step two, hypothesis. Step three, experiment. That's it. That's the scientific method. But if you know that, back to front and inside out, when somebody puts a claim up, you can just ask them those questions in order. Okay, what's the observed phenomena? What did we see happen in nature that we wondered what the cause of it was? And if they can't show it you, that's it. Dead on arrival. That's when it usually falls apart right there. Well, you didn't know, Nathan, synthetic equals natural. 
uh, the definition of set- synthetic would be that a man made it though, not natural. Yeah, it's, got, it's a pun. It's been. But again, if you want to say that, that's fine because you can put it through the method, and if it's synthetic, um, that means the cause is a man made it. That you know, that's why synthetic things don't go through the method because you know the cause already. <laughs> it's synthetic right. what what what, what right. made this happen well a man made it happen that's what synthetic means yep you're assuming the, the meanings of words have meaning so that's your your bad my bad <laughs> <laughs> as you can see i'm kind of stuck on that one because it's the most preposterous thing i've ever heard one of these globe idiots say in my life okay so this is ruhif the same man who said because Brian Mullen didn't understand the meaning of conservation and momentum, an anti-flat earth rhetoric that flies in the face of a claim we have Coriolis effect. He was perfectly justified in having his career threatened just before he got married because he should really understand the conservation of momentum, even though it's not something the globe claims. Meanwhile, the same person said, understanding the definitions... Actually, can you quote him verbatim, Chocolate? Definitions of words are meaningless. outrageous uh, just just to break that down though there's a direct contradiction in those very words meaningless what's a definition it's the meaning of the word that's why it's my favorite one right now so to paraphrase meanings are meaningless that's what ruhif actually said yep brilliant you know something i've been thinking about this thing over the last few days, um, you do, to to do actually derive meaning, design, or purpose. Choice is involved because, you, like, even in language, you have to choose the letters you want to use to convey the meaning. There has to be a choice. If there's no choice, you can't even have any form of intellect or a design or anything. So, choice is necessary. If we all all we are is laws of nature, then there is no choice. What is you're, randomness? What is fluctuations? You're, you're, you're taking this to the beginning of existence with that statement, aren't you? In other words, because we are knowers, we have a direct influence on how the world comes to pass, and you can easily summarise that. You can show how people change the world they live in by doing things. That's easy to qualify. But by the same token, without having knowledge, understanding, choice to be made in the first instance, we wouldn't have existence at all because it all starts with knowledge and knowledge starts with a knower i intelligence and without that we don't have anything and, and you can't put it, you can't impose if, if there's no choice no intellect no knowing everything is random so even if i design something a phone whatever you design so to, so to speak it's just you can all you can argue is that it's a byproduct of just the randomness of the way the universe worked itself out. There's no choice involved, and that is precisely what There's the nothing. heliocentric method sets out to take from you. If all of the things that you are influenced by suggest that there are no choices to be made anymore, in fact they've already been made for you, you are limited as an individual. But the person who's making those choices for you is still arbitrarily assigning definitions, meanings sometimes an entire paradigm or two well those people are literally in control of your world now you have a tacit acceptance of that because you don't really know that it's happening but once you do you can either brace against it which in my opinion is so pathetic because there's an opportunity for you to take advantage of that and realize that i'm not saying you're god but you have a huge amount of influence on the world around you if you choose to recognize the power that you can express just by being just by having choices to make like i say if they've been taken away well, from you gonna... and made for you suddenly you're powerless well and here's the other thing aspect of it too you cannot do true scientific investigation without choice because you must be able to freely choose to go wherever the evidence lies if not it's you're back to you're back to square one again if you can't make that choice, then even us being here on the server, the flat earthers, globers, whatever you want to put us, we're just we're just we're just bouncing to our DNA. We're just bouncing to the chemical processes in our in our head. 
So why are we even arguing? Why are we even presenting evidence if, if there is no choice involved, even to determine if the evidence is correct or not? Well, didn't you know... Might as well just you, shut did, the server down and be done with it. Well, didn't you know you being is just a massive coincidence and chance anyway, so it doesn't really amount to much given that you're a speck of dust on a spinning sphere flying in an ever-expanding soup of nothingness, making you and your choices in this world pretty meaningless, Paul. Didn't you know that? I mean, that is the heliocentric way after all. I'm also the sense that we're going to die in the heat death of the universe anyway, so I'm also the stand it now. Just, just don't worry about it. Let's just stop. Let's just be done. Yeah, meanwhile, the Earth is obviously observably, measurably, and navigatably flat, and an absolutely amazing, beautiful place to inhabit. With that, though, I am going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley premiering streams for hopefully smashing the super chat liking commenting sharing subscribing and becoming a nathan oakley 1980 channel member also below this video you can get 50 pounds for swapping your uk electricity supplier to octopus energy i've been nathan oakley and i'll see you all in the next video